Genesis block and blockchain and have a handle presentation all built out for you. A little cool wavy background there going. It's pretty neat. So basically, what is the Genesis block? The Genesis block is essentially the first block in any in any blockchain. So essentially, it's known as block zero. It's the very first block, and this is where you start that whole process of the blockchain. Now, you can have multiple different chains, and each one of those will have its own Genesis block. So it's effectively the ancestor of every other block inside that chain. You can trace this lineage back to that Genesis block. It doesn't matter how many blocks you've got. But that's essentially what it is. This is the starting point of your blockchain. So it's really the most important block that you've got. So there's some really unique properties to the Genesis block, sometimes referred to as block zero. And the biggest one is that its previous hash value is gonna be set to zero, zero x zero, or just a big long line of zeros. Because there's no process data before that Genesis block. All the other blocks will have sequential numbers, um, the nonce starting by one or some other nonce. Um, they don't need to be sequential. I have previous hash set to a previous block. So again, it's just kind of neat that in technical terms, you're going to have that Genesis block with a previous hash zero value of zero. And then everything else builds on top of that, including all other blocks, you know, having that sequential number. Um, to go along with it and in terms of the nonce so they need do not need to be sequential right so a hash of a genesis block is added to all new transactions in the new block a combination is used to create this unique hash and again this process is repeated until all new blocks are added to the blockchain and at some point you know that blockchain does have an inbuilt limit so there's some kind of fun history but this is the a very famous copy of the initial bitcoin um, genesis block and they actually embedded um, a, a uh, headline in there for the for January 20 2009 and the chancellor on the brink of second bailout or bankruptcy because if you remember back in 2008 all the banks failed and everybody freaked out so that bit about this Genesis block it can contain any data including what the blockchain is for and that's important right especially if you're going to be doing something like voting if you're going to be doing something like uh, student transaction I could have my own um, educational transaction blockchain for all the education that I have, or all the videos I've watched, or all these other things that I've done to improve myself along the way. So this is really a good and interesting way of having historical tracking that you can do or use since day one. And it doesn't just need to be Bitcoin. It can be anything else that has a sequential history to it that would be worthy of being in a blockchain itself. So that Genesis block though, um, is really the, the keystone of all this. You know, without the Genesis block, you know, other miners are going to be having a hard time trusting that blockchain and know when and how it started. So again, it's just impractical. You always have to have a starting point. In theory, while there's no real need for the Genesis block, it is necessary to have a starting point that everyone can trust. Right? So whoever generated that Genesis block is really important. If it was just some rando elementary school that started my Genesis block for education, I'd be like, okay, well, that's not really um, where I went to school for the first time, and I don't know who you are. So that um, trust is important for that Genesis block. And then again, every physical chain must begin with a single physical ring. So that Genesis block is the first single ring of that entire blockchain as you go. So you can see it like a foundation, you know, without having a good solid starting point, this whole thing falls apart. You could also do it as a starting point in a race. It depends on how you need to visualize it to make it work. But if every miner just started where they wanted, you'd have no consensus point. So there's no basis for trust inside that blockchain. So everyone understanding this is the Genesis block really allows for people to have that initial basis for trust and gives everybody a good place to start on the process. So actually what's inside the block is actually really kind of interesting because there's a number of different uh, data fields in there. A number of transactions, transaction fee, block height, timestamp, knots, block difficulty, and data. And there's uh, really kind of interesting on how this goes together because what's inside the block is really the important part, right? So the number of transactions. And basically that transaction is a transfer of value that's broadcast to the network and collected into blocks. And Bitcoin, that would be the number of coins. That would be the value, right? So that Dan transferred 100 Bitcoins to blah, blah, blah. Spent a lot of money, right? A transaction typically references previous transaction outputs as the new transaction inputs and dedicates all input Bitcoin values to new outputs. So basically it says if I moved a bunch of money over to, to Tommy, then that would be that transaction output. And then Tommy would be having a new transaction input of however many Bitcoin that I gave him. Transactions are not encrypted. So you can actually view every transaction ever collected into a block. So if I send 100 Bitcoins to Tommy, then you know, there, may be there may be tax implications in there because the IRS could literally pull down the entire blockchain and see who got what. 
So when Elon Musk bought what a couple million dollars worth of Bitcoin, and when he sells them, um, if the IRS is involved in there, they'll know that he sold some money and made some money off of it. And can you actually be taxed for what you make off of Bitcoin? Yeah, interesting question. I don't know the answer to that one, but it is just kind of interesting, right? And the idea is that these transactions are buried underneath enough confirmations that they could be considered irreversible. So if I send 100 Bitcoin to Tommy and it's only registered once, we might be able to reverse that later on down the road. Um, it's sort of like what happened with that $14 million NFT theft that happened over, over, the, over the last couple of weekends. So we were able to, that guy was able to recover some of his $14 million uh, worth of, of NFTs um, because there weren't enough confirmations. And so they're able to reverse some of that, which is interesting that Bitcoin really kind of had a, a problem with being able to reverse transactions because they really do want to make these things permanent. So the other thing that makes this really kind of interesting, too, is that transaction fee. I've done a previous video on the transaction fee because that kind of surprised me. So basically, and I love this part of being a miner, it's almost worth just opening up a full node, you know, in your basement and, and letting it collect uh, Bitcoin fees over, over time, right? And not worrying about it. So the blockchain fee is a cryptocurrency transaction fee that's charged to users when performing crypto transactions. And right now, especially if you look out at some of the NFT markets, you're looking at transactions that are about $250 a pop. So that's a really big barrier to entry, right? And that fee is collected in order to process the transaction on the network. So if you wanted to and you saw a business opportunity, you could actually do a low cost transaction fee that did not require second a seconds worth of t processing time, right? You could do one that had a slower delay for a uh, shorter or lower processing fee. And again, there's just some kind of interesting things that go along with that transaction fee. Um, you need to pay the blockchain fee to ensure your crypto cryptocurrency transfers arrive in a timely manner. So if you're doing cryptocurrency transfers, then that transaction fee is basically, hey, I need you to do this in four seconds or I need you to do this in, in one second. Right. And it's arrive in a timely manner. That blockchain fee is one of the main tools used to speed up crypto transactions because we do have a congestion issue with that blockchain network. You can only process so many things given the size of the network. They only have so many transactions per second. So you basically pay your way to get to the head of the line on that transaction process. So the fee will increase, especially if there's a major world event, if your crypto account uh, has got a lot of micro deposits like referral bonuses, um, uh, how much congestion there is on the network, how much stuff is moving around. So that's the interesting part to all this, um, that you can get a higher fee the more there's congestion on the network. The lower the blockchain fee is, the lower your transaction's priority in the blockchain network. You know, when we were looking at NFTs, you know, I really didn't honestly care if it actually went into the network or not. I wasn't going to pay, you know, 250 bucks to get it in there as my transaction fee. So I just kind of like went, well, no, I'm not going to do that. All right. So block height. Block height refers to the specific location in the blockchain. So your blockchain has its genesis blocks and may have, you know, 17,000 blocks after that. That number is how many confirmed blocks precede it. So if your block height is 100, then you're 100 blocks away from the Genesis block. If your block is 17,000, then your block height is 17,000. You're 17,000 steps away from the Genesis blocks. And it's an important measure of rate at which new blocks are being added to the blockchain in question, right? So as you go through, it's also used as an identifier for each individual block. So you can see if blocks are missing. So that's kind of a neat thing on that block height that kind of gives you a path on who's got it. This should be a very specific, unique number to each of the blocks themselves so they know how far away from the genesis blocks they're at so sometimes you may get a duplicate block especially if it's someone if uh, two miners are working on the same problem at the same time um, they'll have the same number and when two blocks are created with the same block height you may fork it accidentally you may fork that blockchain or you may result in a block being orphaned and if a block is orphaned no one gets paid for it Right, so that can also be another problem as well. Um, orphan blocks we'll cover in a different lecture on this one. So whatever outcome occurs, duplicate blocks cannot appear on any one given blockchain. Right, so if you've got two people working on block 17,000, the first person to get block 17,000 wins the race. So if they've got better hardware or running you know, hundreds of thousands of GPUs down in the basement and they're able to process data much quicker, then there you go or they got to it early. They got to it milliseconds early can be a problem. Sort of like when you're watching the Olympics, right? Shaving milliseconds off your time running down the hill. That's the same kind of concept. And you don't want to have that orphan block though. 
So, but you do want to make sure that you are using um, that block height as a way to measure where you are in the blockchain. The other thing that's interesting too is the timestamp. So it's just basically a standard Unix timestamp, right? And the interesting part about this is an unsigned integer. So at some point, um, it will run out of space. So I think that's something like 68 years from the time I recorded this. But again, it's just that universal time code. It's just a standard timestamp. It's nothing special. Um, anyone that's ever worked with, with any kind of, of timing mechanisms um, will understand the timestamp without a problem. And again, what's interesting though is that the timestamp has to be accepted as valid if it's greater than the median timestamp of the previous eleven box, right? So you do have a 10 minute processing time right now. So it has to be network adjusted time within plus or minus two hours and the previous 11 blocks to be accepted as valid. So those timestamps are also used as a way of concurring the data, making sure that the data is concurrent. So block timestamps are not exactly accurate. They don't need to be, but they only need to be accurate within an hour or two. So there is some time delay built into the networking process that you can understand as you go through and you, you make things. So that network adjusted time then is node plus local universal time, right? And again, it's just one of those things to kind of be aware of. And then the nonce, the number only used once. And that's a number to be added or encrypted a block in the blockchain when rehash meets the difficulty level restrictions and uh, restrictions. The nonce is the number that the blockchain miners are solving for in order to receive cryptocurrency. So interesting, right? So nonces are used for a range of computing um, networking applications, authentication of purchases, two factor auth authentication or other kinds of account recovery electronic signatures. So the nonce is actually really kind of important. A blockchain nonce is the number added to a hashed or encrypted block in a blockchain so that you've got it. And it's again, it's just used only once and it's not going to be used twice. Um, kind of a neat way of making sure that a block is authenticated as well. And then block difficulty. So block difficulty is a lot more abstract. And this is one of those weird things that after every 2016 blocks or about every two weeks um, that the metric is continuing to recalculate it. And basically, it's that hash power being thrown at the network. The more difficult the process of solving math problems becomes for miners on the network, meaning it harder for them to earn that block reward, that proof of work, right? And right now, that proof of work is about 10 minutes. And then that resets every two weeks or every 2016 blocks. So if less miners participate in the network, the block difficulty can adjust downward. If there are more miners on the network, then that difficulty will go up and it will take longer to process those specific Bitcoin or transaction blocks in there. So the Bitcoin network has a global block difficulty, all right, and that valid blocks must have a hash below that target. And that is a fluctuating global block difficulty you would need to go through like Bitcoin Explorer to find out what today's current um, global block difficulty is. And the other thing that's interesting too is that mining pools will also have a very pool specific share of difficulty setting, all right, and they're gonna be trying to get to that lower limit because then they can process that information quicker. So again, block difficulty is really kind of interesting. It's a metric that continuously recalculates and adjusts after a certain number of blocks, and it's all about that hashing power being thrown at the network. And again, it can raise or lower depending on how many people are in there doing mining. And then there's the data. The data that's stored in each side of the block and depends on the type of blockchain. So like when I sent 100 Bitcoin to Tommy, that would be the data. Right. If I was voting, I would be um, having that data inside the block would be attached to the polling place, the date, time, who I voted for, um, how that worked in the national level, because my genesis block would probably be at the state level or at the federal level. Right. In terms of how that would all work. Um, the big drawback to having it for voting is that it needs to be a lot quicker than than every 10 minutes. Um, for the processing power. Otherwise, the news channels would probably freak out because they're not getting instantaneous results. But again, that data can be anything depending on what industry is being used for. Um, but again, the issue we're going to have is velocity of the data when it comes into there and whether it's suitable for being in a blockchain or not. So kind of in summary on this one, right, the way that a block is set for Genesis block sets the stage for every other block that comes along. Each block has specific fields and then to provide the authentication and the immutability for the data, hashing, signing, um, and then where it fits in, the nonce, all that kind of good stuff, and then the transaction fee to make sure it actually gets in there and gets processed. Some people that don't pay transaction fees may never get into the blockchain because no one will touch it. All right, the data itself is in the block. It can be anything. It can be Dan sent 100 Bitcoin to Tommy or my voting or anything else that's in there, and then that's considered immutable once it's been approved and put into the blockchain. 
So again, it's kind of interesting how that Genesis block works and how it feeds into the rest of that blockchain network, whether it's Bitcoin or whether it's anything else that comes along the way. So thank you for watching this lecture. I will be back with the next one and you all have a great day. Thanks. See you in the next lecture.